the passing of longtime Congressman Alcee Hastings in April opened a race to fill that seat in the 20th Congressional District. That's parts of Broward and Palm Beach counties. Eleven Democrats and two Republicans are running and early voting sites in Broward and Palm Beach counties are open right now. Local 10 News reporter Trent Kelly is at one of those voting sites in Fort Lauderdale. Trent, good morning. Got any business there? Any voters? Yeah, Michael and Glenna, no doubt a very crowded ballot for this special election. The polls, though, not so crowded. In fact, if you take a look behind me, you can see in the couple of hours that we've been here at this particular early voting location, you can literally count the number of voters we've seen on one hand. In addition to this being an off year election, this is also the first one to be held since the governor signed that new election bill SB 90 into law, and it's already causing some confusion, especially when it comes to voting by mail. A slow start to early voting in Broward County today. This was the scene outside the African American Research Library near Fort Lauderdale, where poll workers far outnumbered any voters. On the ballot is the choice to fill the congressional seat once held by the late Alcee Hastings. The special election becoming the first since the state passed a new controversial election law under the guise of improving election security. Now, in order to vote by mail, the new law requires either a Florida driver license number, a state ID number, or the last four digits of a social security number. As a result, Pompano Beach realtor Larry Wallenstein says he got this letter from the supervisor of elections telling him he could not vote. There's absolutely no reason that they have to collect all of this data. You need to go check. Visit Broward election supervisor Joe Scott says he's just obeying the new law, even if he doesn't agree with it. He's now sending out more than 73,000 letters to Broward voters, warning them their voter information is incomplete. I'm certainly not um, in favor of the um, new obstacles that are being put between uh, the voter and the ballot box, um, but this is the law of the land. Yeah, so if you got one of those letters in the mail, make sure to get that taken care of. Again, the polls now officially open for early voting here at some select sites across Broward County. They will be open from now until the Sunday before Election Day from 10 in the morning until 7 at night. We've got more information on early voting and everything else you need to know about this special election. That's on our website, local10.com. Reporting for This Week in South Florida, I'm Trent Kelly, Local 10 News. Trent, thanks so much. Trent, thanks. All right, since April, when Elsie Hastings died, the 800,000 or so people who live in the 20th Congressional District have not had a voice in Congress. There are 13 people running to be that voice. 11 are Democrats, and in this overwhelmingly Democratic district, one likely will be the winner. We hosted three last week, three candidates today. Again, and all of them today are current state lawmakers. State Representative Bobby DeBose of Fort Lauderdale, State Representative Omari Hardy of West Palm Beach, and State Senator Perry Thurston of Fort Lauderdale, and all had to resign their elected state positions when they became candidates for Congress. And it is really great to have all three of you with us today. Hello, everyone. Hey, hi, how Hello. are you? Welcome. We are, we, are so, morning. we are so glad you are here. Uh, Bobby DeBose, let me begin with you. I kind of go through some uh, issues that may not take a long time, but let's begin with reproductive rights. Are you in support of the Roe versus Wade decision? And uh, are you concerned that the Supreme Court is going to hear both the Texas case and the Mississippi case in the next uh, few days? Uh, the answer would be yes, I, I, I am uh, supportive of Roe v. Wade. I'm supportive of a woman's right to choose what's best for her. I'm really concerned um, at this new law and the fact that it's something that's being introduced in Florida. I think that we have to take extreme measures to protect a woman's right. I don't think that it, a man should have the right to tell a woman what to do and that we should stay out of a woman's business. It's just that simple for me. Yeah. Omari Hardy, uh, let you ask you to weigh in on that. What is your position on the Roe decision? I support Roe versus Wade, but I also support the additional rulings that have come from the Supreme Court since then, uh, which provide women additional protection, saying that states can't place undue burdens on their ability to exercise this right. And that is also at stake in these upcoming Supreme Court 
cases and the decisions that will follow. And I am very concerned that this court, which was stacked uh, by President Trump uh, with partisan ideologues. Remember, there are two Supreme Court justices who sit in seats that were stolen, not just from President Obama, but also from President Joe Biden. And this court seems poised to not only overturn uh, protections against the undue burdens, but also they seem poised to overturn Roe versus Wade. So I think we have to not only codify these decisions into federal law, but I think we need to expand the Supreme Court uh, to really protect not just a woman's right to choose, but also our voting rights and other rights that have come under yeah, attack. Yeah, expand it, expand it, uh, Omari, by how many? Four new justices? Three? What would you do? Four new justices. Harry Thurston, uh, we've just expanded the question from <laughs> from abortion and right to life rights <laughs> to expanding the Supreme Court. Go. Right. Now, Way in. Absolutely. Absolutely. I um, certainly support Roe versus Wade, and I think that it's the law of the land and it should remain so. I support the Women's Health Protection Act. I think that it provides those additional uh, protections and uh, abortion is health care. So without a doubt, and I don't think that with the current makeup of the Supreme Court, it's a question of if they will attempt to overturn it. It's more like a question of when. And I don't look at it as an expansion of the Supreme Court. I look at it as upright, bringing the courts to where it was. You know, there were seats that were stolen. Well, we've got to address how do we get there to correct that situation. That may be expanding or that may be term limits. There are a number of things that I think should be on the table that we need to talk about if we're going to protect the rights that's been gained in the past to make sure as we move forward, we don't have that issue. Bobby DeBose, next question. Uh, why don't you start us off on the question of revolving health care? Last week, we had three other candidates, two of which were actually in the health care business. Of the 800,000 or so people who live in District 20, one in five of them remain without health insurance, despite the Affordable Care Act under President Obama, but, uh, despite those exchanges. Uh, that's a pretty staggering amount in that district. And how do you overcome that? I think the way we overcome it is we have to address it on the federal level. Uh, since I've been in the state legislature under two governors, we refuse to expand Medicaid, which is a result of individuals not having coverage. And as the pandemic has shown us, it has literally been the difference between life and death. So it's definitely something that we have to do on the federal level, create a program where we can go directly to the people and not through the state. Yeah. Uh, Omari, beyond expanding Medicaid in Florida or accepting billions of dollars from Washington, uh, some of your opponents, not the ones who are here, some of your opponents last week said they favor Medicare for all. What about something like uh, changing the eligibility age of Medicare to, say, 55? Is that something you could support? Look, uh, I support lowering the Medicare eligibility age to the age of a newborn. Uh, I believe in Medicare for all. Uh, we are the richest country in the world. It's unconscionable uh, that we have nearly 30 million people in this country who have no health coverage. It's unconscionable that nearly 20,000 people a year die because they don't have health coverage. And that's simply because some folks don't have the money in their pocket to pay for the care that could save their lives. We have enough resources in this country to ensure that every person has access to health care. I think Medicare for all is the best and most efficient way to do it. Uh, they say that it would cost about $30 trillion over 10 years, which is about $3 trillion a year. Uh, but guess what? We spend $3.8 trillion a year on health care right now. Uh, so in reality, it would save the country about $800 billion a year. But we just have to be OK with getting insurance companies and their profits out of the way. And that's why I believe in Medicare for all. Perry Thurston, do you believe in Medicare for all? What's your position on that? I, I, I believe and thank you, Glenna. I, I believe in Medicare for all who want it. Those people who are happy with their policies, I think we should find a way to make sure that they can keep the health care that they have. That's the problem that we had before. It's not always a zero sum game. And what I think is this, when we, uh, it's easy to say those things, but it's a different thing to fight for. So what, I, what I'd say is this, 
we should have expanded and accepted $50 billion that we turned down. I was a leader in the House at the time. And quite frankly, you may remember as the leader, I shut down the House and my team to make sure that the uh, state and the leadership understood that this was that important to us. So I think that certainly Medicare for all who wants it, and certainly uh, if you have a, pro a policy, if you like it through your business, you should be able to keep it. Um, you know, I think we have some other serious issues to get to with you gentlemen. So let's go ahead and take a kind of an early break here. When we come back, I want to ask each of you about the U.S. Uh, relationship with Israel, BDS, and uh, the Iron Dome. So stay with us. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back. We are joined live and virtually by State Representative Bobby DeVos of Fort Lauderdale, State Representative Omari Hardy of West Palm Beach, and State Senator Perry Thurston of Fort Lauderdale. They are all running for the congressional seat in the 20th District. Uh, Omari Hardy, um, you, you know, you all three know that Elsie Hastings was a very, very strong supporter of Israel, traveled there often, supported Israel in every way in Congress. Uh, Omari Hari, you told me in an interview uh, recently that if you had been a member of Congress, when the vote came up on one billion additional dollars for the Iron Dome anti-missile system, you would have voted against it. Why would you? Well, I appreciate you for mentioning that it was for one billion additional dollars. Uh, we have already this year uh, given Israel three point eight billion dollars, three point eight billion in military aid, five hundred million of which went toward the Iron Dome dome system. Over the past five years, we have given Israel almost three billion dollars in funding for the Iron Dome. And so I think that at some point it's OK to draw a line. We are committed to providing Israel this three point eight billion dollars in military aid every year through 2026. There was uh, an additional expenditure that was asked for. And I think it's OK to say, being as we've already provided you with three point eight billion dollars this year uh, for Israel to cover that expense on their own. And we will continue to provide support uh, in the future. And, and, you know, for me, this isn't about whether you support or oppose the Iron Dome. It's about who should fund the cost of the Iron Dome. And I think it's OK, given that we have funded so much of it thus far, to ask Israel to share their part of the burden for their security. I, I want to take it up. We, we have so little time, so many people, and apologies for that. But I want to ask a question relative to Alcee Hastings on behalf of voters, because here's Vox Pop. Here's what we're hearing. Alcee Hastings won 15 terms in this district. He had tenure. He had seniority, something that no one in this seat is going to have. But he also had something else, a charisma, uh, something intangible. And we are hearing from voters Literally, they want to know who's the next Alcee Hastings. Perry Thurston, kick us off. What can thank you, you tell and, and voters you. about that? Well, I think that the voters should know that uh, Democrats from Jacksonville to Key West have elected me as their leader in the House, in the Senate, and the Florida Legislative Black Caucus. I'm ready to fill the shoes of Alcee Hastings. I know those are big shoes to fill. But, you know, I met Alcee when I was in law school and he was a federal district judge. I think they should look at what leadership looks like in the uh, Florida legislature where we serve. And what they should also look to is the men and women of the AFL-CIO who have endorsed me and the teachers union. You see, working people make up this district. Educators are the one that make up this district. When they had an opportunity to evaluate all of these clients, they selected me as that person, and I'll provide that leadership void that's okay. in existence, and, and not Bobby, just by Al C, but others. Yeah. Uh, Bobby DeBose, uh, you, in fact, are a co-leader of the Florida House of Representatives, or you were before you resigned to run for this office. Uh, how would you fill Al C's very big shoes? Uh, thank you for the question. I am still the uh, uh, leader in the uh, Florida House. And honestly, I don't think collectively that we all could fill our Congressman Alcee Hastings' shoes. My desire is to hopefully one day grow into them. 
And as you spoke to the charisma and Congressman Hastings had a way with people, everyone felt his loss and everyone felt close to him. And he used that in his leadership role and being able to work across the aisles. And that's something that I've been uh, very successful with in, in my tenure in Tallahassee. And I think that's really important when you think about true leadership. It's okay to scream and yell and shout and fight. But at the end of the day, Congressional District 20 has no room for just that. We need results. We need someone who has a record of working across the aisle and passing major legislation like I did this year as it relates to students with disability, restraint seclusion, a piece of legislation that they're working on in uh, D.C. Congressman Scott is trying to pass where there is over 100,000 plus students 78% of them are students with disabilities and black boys who have been subjected to this. I've been successful in Florida, and that's something that I'll go to D.C. and do. And I think that is something that the congressman is known for, really being able to work across the aisle and be effective. Let's give a, a chance for Omari Hardy to answer that question as well. Well, uh, I appreciate that. Look, the thing that most people appreciate about Representative Hastings was that he was a fighter for our community. He was an unapologetic advocate for the people in the district. And I think that I fit that mold, uh, not out of a desire to be like Al C, uh, but just because that is who I am, that is who I have been uh, since the day I became a public servant, serving first at the local level, uh, fighting for poor and working class folks in the city of Lake Worth Beach, and also fighting for poor and working class folks and people of color and women in the Florida House of Representatives. And so I think that's important that we elect someone uh, who is going to stand up on behalf of this community because we are in such a unique historical moment. I mean, it wasn't nine months ago that we had an insurrection at the Capitol, and now we have states uh, controlled by Republicans all across the country who are attacking the last 60 years of progress. They're rolling back the clock on voting rights, on women's reproductive rights here in the state of Florida. They're attacking our First Amendment right to go out into the street and protest and to affirm that Black Lives Matter. I think that we should elect someone who understands what the stakes are, who understands that we are fighting for our democracy, and who is then going to act like it. Uh, I have good relationships with folks on the other side of the aisle. But, you know, I have to tell you, it's hard to be friends with folks who are trying to disenfranchise your constituents. And so, uh, for, you know, for, for my part, uh, I, I, I'm not ashamed of the fact um, that sometimes Republicans and I get into it because we're getting into it over things that really matter. Yeah. For the Omari, I'm district. gonna have to jump in here. I beg your pardon. Want to thank all three of you. Good luck with your campaigns. Next week, we will hear from three more of the candidates who are running in the 20th Congressional District.